Broadcasts of the City of Nina Common Council Meetings are produced by University Studios of the University of Wisconsin, Fox Valley. Nina residents can get information about City Council Meetings, City Committee Meetings, Meeting Agendas, and other documents via the City website, www.ninagov.org. NENA residents can express their opinions about city issues or about these broadcasts by contacting the mayor's office, contacting their city alderman, or by completing the electronic feedback form on the city website, www.ninagov.org. All public portions of the meetings are recorded in entirety and are not edited for playback. We haven't been in here very often. I didn't bring my gavel out of my office. So uh, I would like to call to order the meeting of the Nina Common Council um, for Wednesday, April 7th, 2021. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, due to the public health emergency, uh, we are meeting in uh, person here tonight. We are also meeting uh, virtually for any uh, members or members of the public. Proper notices have been given for this meeting and uh, we appreciate those of you who have come out tonight to, uh, to join us. Um, the first item of business will be the roll call. Uh, clerk Sturm will call the roll call and you'll answer to the clerk as she calls your name please. Patty's back. <laughs> that was a year ago. <laughs> you said Sturm. Pardon? You said Sturm. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> On my last meeting, too. <laughs> sorry. All right. Alderperson Boyette. Here. Bates? I see you. Lang? Here. Lendrum? Here. Fortrip? Here. Hillstrom? Here. Steele? Here. Erickson? Here. And Stevenson? Here. There is a quorum present. Uh, all members are present. Uh, Alderman Bates is with us virtually. Uh, we will uh, start with the Pledge of Allegiance. The Pledge of Allegiance will be led by uh, Alderman Hillstrom. All right, well, welcome everyone. Uh, it's good to be back, and uh, the weather is cooperating. It's such a nice day out there today. It's given us a little preview of what we have to look forward to hopefully soon as far as weather. But we may get some rain, I guess, tonight. But thank you all for coming. Um, the first item of business uh, will be uh, some introduction. Um, and, and we have mayor's appointments, which we have none tonight. But we do have a couple of recognition of the previous month's retirees. This is just something that we started recently so that the public themselves will get to know a little bit about people who've spent their entire career here at the Nina, you know, most of their career here at, uh, this for the city of Nina, working on their behalf. And uh, we'd just like to publicly thank these individuals. So the retirements in March 2021, were Daniel Rabidou. Dan worked in the Public Works Department. He was on the street crew. And uh, Dan worked for the Public Works Department here in Nina for 27 years. So we would all like to say thank you to Dan for his years of dedicated service to the city of Nina. And then we also, in March, had uh, Michael Yonke. Michael, I believe, was a captain, Captain Yonke. Uh, who retired from Nina Menasha Fire Rescue. Mike had, uh, he was retired as, as a fire officer. Um, he had 31 years of service with the city of Nina. Uh, so we'd also like to say thank you for that outstanding service and dedication that Mike uh, gave to the citizens of Nina and Menasha as a member of the Nina Menasha Fire Rescue team. So thank you both gentlemen for your time. 
The third item, item number three, is approval of the council proceedings of March, 20, uh, March 17th, 2021 regular session. Is there a motion? Move to approve. Second. Okay. There's a motion by Alderman Lundrum, seconded by, uh, did you second it or did? Uh, I think Alderman Borchert. Uh, there's a motion and a second. Is there any corrections, additions, or anything? If not, is there any objection to unanimous consent to approve the minutes? Hearing or seeing no objection, that's so ordered. Tonight we have a public hearing. The public hearing is to consider the redevelopment area number four, South Commercial Street Redevelopment Plan. This is a public hearing. Um, at this time, I will open the public hearing. If you're, if you're here to speak on the issue or if you're on um, the uh, uh, computer here and would like to address the council on the redevelopment area number four, South Commercial Street Redevelopment Plan, uh, all we do is ask that you give your name and address so that we have it for the record. So I will open up the public hearing on this uh, redevelopment area of South Commercial Street. Is there anyone here who would like to speak to the council on that issue or online? Anyone here who would like to speak during the public hearing portion for the redevelopment of, North, of South Commercial Street, the redevelopment plan? Last call. All right, seeing no one here for that item, I will close the public hearing and we will go on to item number five, which is the CDA Media Development Authority report that pertains to the public hearing. This is from the meeting of March 22nd, 2021. I apologize, who's given that report? Who's the CDA rep? Okay, uh, Alderman Lundrum, would you like to give that? No, I am not ready for CDA. Yeah, I wish I would have had some warning. Would you like to make a motion? Well, or Alderman Hillstrom, go ahead. Or Marge, I'm sorry, I didn't see that. Go ahead, Marge. No, but... I'm sorry. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, I am the second member of the CDA. I would like to report out from the CDA meeting of March 22nd, 2021. Minutes can be found on the city website. The CDA recommends council approve resolution 2021-08, approving boundaries for redevelopment area number four, South Commercial Street, approving redevelopment plan, therefore, and I would so move. I'll second it. There's a motion by Alderman Bates, seconded by Alderman Lundrum. Questions or comments? Alderman Stevenson. Yeah, thank you. Um, so for, I guess either member of the, of the CDA from the council perspective or uh, uh, Brad or I think Brad's here. Maybe. Brad's on, on oh, the yeah, Okay, computer. so I know I saw him somewhere. Oh, or Chris. Um, so the motion is to Approve the boundaries and approving the redevelopment plan. Therefore, um, I'm I'm okay approving the existence of the South Commercial Street corridor study plan, but I have concerns about specific items in there, especially the bike path lanes that were identified on page 32 as being down Maple Street, um, and um, we also have a number of street uh, configuration options, and I just want to understand what the council's expectation can be, given that there are multiple options available to that South Commercial Street um, uh, profile. What, what by approving this resolution? What does that mean? The council binds itself to one to the Maple Street location for a bike path, and two specifically to road width on South Commercial. Director Hayes? It, it doesn't bind the council to anything. And just for clarification, it, and it, it, I understand it, it can be a little bit confusing, but the, 
the, the South Commercial Redevelopment Plan or the plan that you're referring to is not the redevelopment plan that we're approving tonight. So this, this is very much a statutory requirement. And as Brad can go on to explain, really, as we mentioned all along, one of the primary reasons for doing this is the ability or is, a re, is the ability to bring block grant funding to the district. So this plan and the plan that you're referring are actually two different things, even though they are very much related. This particular plan, I would view as the first step towards implementation of the plan that you're referring to, but specific to your question, nothing in that plan binds the council to do anything. Yeah, that, that's fine. And as long as we make sure, uh, Clerk Cheslock, that the minutes act accurately reflect what Chris just said. <laughs> Anyone else? How I view this is somewhat of a somewhat of a vision statement, but um, there's plenty of options in this report, and so uh, when we get around to doing it, there, there might be more options. But I think I think it's good to point this out that just because it's in this document doesn't mean that, that it's going right. to happen that way. And the, the council's got plenty of decisions to make forthcoming with regards to that redevelopment. Plan. So, good question. Director, uh, Deputy Director Schmidt, do you have anything you'd like to add before we move on? Uh, just very really quickly, again, the primary focus of the creation of this redevelopment area is to be able to create a facade improvement program. Um, so, that's kind of really the, the primary focus of this and uh, the, the reason why it was developed. All right, thank you. All right, so there's a motion and a second to approve resolution number 2021-08, approving the boundaries for redevelopment area number four, South Commercial Street, and approving the re redevelopment plan there for. All in favor will vote aye. All opposed will vote no as the clerk calls the roll, please. Alderperson Bates. Aye. Lang. Aye. Landrum. Aye. Borchert. Aye. Hillstrom? Aye. Steele? Aye. Erickson? Aye. Stevenson? Aye. And Boyette? Aye. Motion carries. That motion passes. Thank you. Uh, item number six is the public forum. Public forum is an opportunity for any member uh, of the community or anyone to come and um, talk to the council on any issue that they would like, speak to the council. Uh, all we do is ask you, you give your name and your address, and we limit you to five minutes. Is there anyone here who tonight, either in person uh, or online, who'd like to speak to the council during the public uh, forum portion? Come on up. Hello, my name is Darren. I'm the Milwaukee Fiance Council. Just a simple time long and not to walk the street. I will walk the streets. I could understand it. Carla Ruthven, Metropolitan Milwaukee Fair Housing Council, 759 Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Thank you. Thank you both for coming. We will be taking up the issue of the CDA uh, block grant funding uh, shortly, and at that point, we'll allow you to speak. Is that okay? That's fine. Thank you. Thank you for coming. All right. Welcome. Mary Gluckner. We are doing this hybrid, which is uh, computer and in person. So we have some adjustments to make in that with microphones and that to make sure everything gets picked up uh, on the tape so that when people view it, they can hear us. So go ahead. Mary Glessner, G-L-E-S-N-E-R, 1301 Nature Trail Drive here in Nina. So I would like to speak in support of resolution number 2021-07, which is in regards to the modification of the current plot restrictions in the Nature Trails subdivision. Um, so I wanted to just first off thank Chris Hayes, Brad Schmidt, and the Public Services and Safety Committee members for really thoughtfully considering the affected area, which is the Nature Trails subdivision. I know this has been something that's brought forward in the past, and so the current resolution 
really addresses some of the concerns that were brought up in the past, as well as you know, thoughtfully considering which homes the concerns apply to and which they don't. And so one of the concerns that was brought up in the past was we don't want to create either real or perceived safety concerns with creating alleyway effects in areas where the public might be walking through. And this really pertains to properties that are on the east side of Nature Trail. And some of those property owners have been the ones who have expressed concern in the past. And so the current resolution protects the restrictions and allows those areas to not allow fencing, creating any of those alleyways, and those restrictions would stay in place. The restrictions that would be removed, however, would help the rest of the neighborhood and some of the properties that don't fall within that range to have the ability to have fences. And so, for example, the three properties that would be affected on Buckhorn Lane, which are lots 39, 40, and 41, these three properties actually already have fences. So removing the restriction would actually just bring those properties into alignment um, rather than having them actually be out of line with the current restrictions. Um, and then my lot happens to be lot three. So there are two lots, lot two and lot three, that are on the west side of Nature Trail. In particular, my lot is one that is on a corner. It is on a busy street, really a pretty major artery, which is Pendleton. So Pendleton and Nature Trail, there's a lot of traffic. There's also just a lot of people that go by and go to the nearby park, which is one of the great things about where I live and one of the motivations for me buying that house. Um, but it also means that I really have the intention to put fencing on my property because I want to keep my kids safe, right? That stray kicked ball and when a child sees something that they want to go run after, my concern is the safety of my own children. And then there are other properties that have been outlined here, such as lots 20, 21, 22, where there might be, there's stormwater drain offs, there's other areas that are abutting waterways. Those property owners in the future might also have concerns about safety and want to fence in their properties for their family safety, for their pet safety. Um, again, no, con no concerns over creating any sort of real or perceived safety effects with those properties. And then in terms of bringing overall consistency to the neighborhood, there were property owners um, on lots 51 through 54 that expressed concern that there's really um, not consistency between that particular trailway with properties on the north side, properties on the south side. So on the north side, they were allowed to have fences. On the south side, they weren't. This is something where it's not a narrow alleyway. So again, it would help with bringing that consistency to the overall neighborhood and improve the overall subdivision. And with this resolution, there still are limitations to the type of fencing people can put up. Why is that? Well, that's because those of us who choose to live there, we love the nature preserve, right? We love the beauty, and this allows us to preserve the beauty of the neighborhood, doesn't block the view, or doesn't um, you know, cause unnecessary distraction just from the natural beauty of the neighborhood. And so when you're considering this resolution, I hope that you will um, vote in favor of it and pass it tonight. Again, I thank everyone who's been involved in crafting this, and I feel it's a very solid resolution. Thank you. Thank you very much. Anyone else in the chambers that would like to speak? Come on up. There are some Clorox wipes up there if you want to wipe the microphone down if you'd like. But I guess I read something. The CDC says you can't pick it up on surface anymore. But, but you're free to use them if you'd like. Welcome, Ron. I'd like to briefly just uh, speak on the mayor's proclamation of changing the name of the microphone oh. a little bit. Or bring it. There you go. Yeah, changing the name of the uh, Nina Slough to uh, Nina Creek. For 60 years, citizens of Nina have discussed changing the name of the once contaminated slough. Now we'll have a new name promoting the community as a kayaking, canoeing, fishing, recreational waterway that will positively promote our city. We all can say. Come to the Nina Creek and enjoy the beauty that runs through the center of our great city. Thank you to all who have been involved in this year's long effort. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you, Ron. Anyone else who'd like to speak during the public forum? Welcome. Come on up. Please just state your name and address for the council.
Marika Van Royen, 428 9th Street in Nina. As um, I'm a member of the Race Equity Committee of the Wisconsin Public Health Association, and I'm also currently supporting Winnebago County in equitable um, distribution of vaccines. And, and we meet uh, every two weeks as a community group to support decision-making around vaccine distribution in our region. Um, I want to thank you for allowing me to speak, and I want to say that I'm here because I desperately want Nina to put in place a mask mandate. We know that masks work. We know that they protect our loved ones. And um, we know that they also protect people who are most vulnerable in our community, which may or may not include any of us. We know that there's a new variant on the rise. We know that in Wisconsin, our COVID cases are trending upwards. Once again, we don't know yet where that will end. And we also know that economic recovery depends on beating this pandemic. We need to be all hands on deck to get this under wraps so that we can once again go back into our community, spend our money in our restaurants and be safe and keep our families safe. We want our kids to go back to school, and we know this new variant is now attacking our children. I ask you to demonstrate wise leadership for our community. I was not shocked that our state legislature um, ended an emergency measure to protect our state's citizens before the emergency was over. It's appalling to me but not surprising. I believe that we can do better, and if we can't do it at the state level, I would ask everybody who has any kind of uh, authority in any jurisdiction to consider doing a mask mandate where you can. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Anyone else like to address the council? Any of the folks online would like, anyone would like to address the council on any topic? Uh, yes, Mayor. Ms. Would. Uh, I'll call on uh, Ellen Coons and then uh, uh, Doug Guerin. Ellen? Thank you, um, Mayor. Uh, Ellen Coons, 707 Congress Place in Nina. Um, it has been 10 months since you last heard from a Coons at a council meeting. Uh, I am the wife of former. Alderman Christopher Coons, who died last June. Uh, I have a few things to say, and I will try to be more brief than tougher would be. <laughs> um, first, to the department heads, the city department heads, and all city staff, two words, thank you. Thank you, I thank you for continuing city services over the last year, despite the challenges of the pandemic. I know it could not have been easy to have figured out how to keep moving forward, but I appreciate having clean water, having garbage pickup, having trails developed, parks, uh, parks maintained. Thank you to everybody who, who continued to, to do such a good job. Um, second, I am here tonight to support the ordinance to create a temporary mask order in the city of Nina. Um, as Marika said, um, it's well documented that masks are an exceptionally effective at stopping the virus spread. They are proactive and easy to do. They are so easy to do. They are inexpensive to do, uh, especially compared to the reactive situations of hospitalizations, death, and long hauler symptoms. Um, <clears throat> What you do tonight will impact what we will get to do this summer. And I, I know that we've heard it all over and over and over again, and people are getting tired of it. Um, I may be more tired of this pandemic than most. I have been living a life of near solitude since Tuffer died. And I am grateful that I've gotten my first vaccine shot and that I might in the next month 
be able to finally grieve my husband along with people and have some hugs. But I can tell you, if this virus is allowed to swing around and hit us hard again, I, I am not sure how long I can hang on without human interaction. And I know I have intentionally created a bubble with my small immediate family in order to keep us all safe. But I miss my dear friends in Minnesota. I miss Tuffer's sisters in Minnesota. And I, I will get to see some people once I'm fully vaccinated, but please know these variants are still unknown how they're going to change and viruses are going to do what they need to do to survive regardless of what the humans try to do. So let's not give them the virus more bodies to inhabit so that it, it cannot mutate further. That's really all I wanted to say. Um, I may not stay for the whole meeting. It's been a pretty emotional day for me. I had my first trip to Menards without her. And thank goodness for the mask because I could cry behind it. So thank you for your time. Thank you, thank you to the city, all the employees of the city for all they've done this last year. I appreciate the city services we receive and thank you to the city council and to the mayor thank very you. much. Thank you. Thank you uh, very much for joining us, Ellen. Uh, Mr. Gearn. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And, and thank you, Ellen, uh, for those comments. Um, it's tough to follow up on that. Um, <clears throat> my name is Doug Gearn. I live at 1236 West Breeze Drive in Nina. Um, I also serve um, as the director and health officer for the Winnebago County Health Department. And I wanted to take a moment to just share a few comments uh, related to the new business item on the temporary mask order uh, that you're hearing about tonight. Um, certainly wanted to provide support for that. Um, the health department tracks our situation within this county very closely. Uh, we've been fortunate to, you know, experience it a decline in cases that started in November um, and really uh, continued until about five weeks ago, at which point things leveled off a bit at, at, a, high, at a high level, we would consider a high level. Uh, we had spikes after every holiday um, and then resumed that downward trend. In the, uh, in, the pad, in, in the report that we're releasing tomorrow morning, um, case rates um, are going to be increased at 20% higher than they were for our last week's reporting period. Um, we, we give a burden rate every, every week for the preceding two weeks. And, um, and so we are in a period now where um, for two weeks in a row now we have increasing cases and, and this week it will be a pretty significant increase. Um, as Alan mentioned, we have uh, New variants to be concerned about. Um, we've had we had two positive, uh, two confirmed variants um, in Winnebago County just last week. Uh, one was the uh, variant that was first discovered in the UK, and the other was the first one was was discovered in, in South Africa. Um, we know that they're present. Uh, only a small percentage of positive samples are actually analyzed uh, or genotyped, as we say. Uh, to determine whether they are a variant or not. And we know that these spread very rapidly, much more rapidly than the COVID that we've experienced so far um, and can be uh, more severe in illness. We don't have to look far. We can just look to Michigan right now where Michigan is one of the top five states in the nation. Um, those five states combined make up uh, about 45% of all of the cases. And so despite um, the amount of vaccine that has been made available, we know that COVID can surge even under these conditions right now uh, with, with vaccine present. And in terms of you know where we're at with vaccine currently, um, 
right now for our 65 and up population, or 83% of our 65 and up population have received at least one dose uh, of vaccine, which is really wonderful news. Um, you know, if we look at all age groups that are eligible right now, or actually our entire population, um, about one third of our population has received a dose, yet we still see cases surging in other states. And about one fifth of our population, or roughly 20%, are fully, currently fully vaccinated. It's going to take us another, at least another couple of months before we reach a point where we have more vaccine available than we have persons that are standing in line to receive it. Um, we, every Friday, we run one of several clinics that are, that are occurring in our area. And at the Sunnyview Clinic um, that we're providing the vaccine for right now, um, we had over 2,000 doses for this week. Um, our signups, um, you know, for the first day with Johnson & Johnson, um, that sign up went up, uh, was, was done in 15 minutes. Um, for our um, Moderna vaccine, which is the two dose series, um, it only it took hours and we were full. Um, and so there's still great demand for vaccine. And I would urge that you consider extending or putting in place a mass mandate, mass mandate until we've at least reached the population that wants to be vaccinated that will really help um, reduce transmission within our community and help reduce uh, the probability of a rapid rise. And if we do see a rapid rise, it will help stem it. Um, it will be worse without it. So um, thank you for, for hearing those comments. And, um, and please let me know if you have any questions. We'll be releasing um, our weekly stats uh, tomorrow morning. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Thank you, Mr. Kieran. Others, anyone else who'd like to address the council? Uh, Jean-Marie Spoyer and then Sarah Creighton. John, uh, Mr. Thank Boyer, you. Go ahead. Thank you very much. Jean-Marie Spoyer, 1101 Nicolet Boulevard, Nina, Wisconsin. I wanted to uh, really echo a lot of the comments that have already been made and also talk about the kids in schools. Uh, we have been... Uh, admirable in our efforts to keep kids in our schools uh, in person when possible. And one of the things we can't lose sight of is that the new British uh, variant is uh, more contagious in a younger population. So that is one of the key attributes of this new variant. It is uh, much more contagious than some of the other variants. And the severity uh, of disease for those who get uh, COVID from this variant is uh, greater. And we do not currently have the ability to vaccinate children under the age of 16. So the masks are really a key element of that protective barrier, enabling us to keep our kids in school, to keep our families working, and it doesn't cost us anything. We must continue to keep the masks in place until we have a better control of the situation. Thank you very much. Thank you for your comments. Uh, Sarah, welcome. Hello, everybody. My name is Sarah Creighton. I'm at 2435 Bruce Street in Nina. I am also um, here to talk in support of the new business item of, of the mask mandate as in three respects. First, as a mom with kids in school. Second, as a citizen of Nina that wants to continue to support businesses. And third, as a uh, community physician who particularly cares for pediatric patients. So first as a mom, as they had spoken to before, I've been really, really impressed with the way that the Nina School District has been supportive of the kids, of our kids being in school. 
as much as possible. And we've only recently, in the last few weeks, been able to send our elementary school age kids back to in-person learning, which has been exceedingly important for working parents and, and for learning and the mental health of our kids. I can tell you as someone who has two boys at Lakeview that the best days are the days that they are in school and their worst days are when they are not in school. Kids are exceedingly adaptable and they're able to wear masks um, in class and they but they also follow the suit of their parents and so understanding that our kids uh, through the Nina Joint School District will continue to wear masks it only seems natural that our children would see that the adults are also supportive of public use of masks. Um, second as a citizen of the, of the community I think that putting a mask a temporary mask mandate in place will um, provide some relief to businesses who don't have to make that choice on their own. It can be exceedingly confrontational for, for someone in a business to have to discuss that it was their personal choice to put a mask mandate in place and then not be able to have the enforcement of the local government to really support that. Um, and then you can kind of put everybody on an even playing field. Finally, um, I, although fair, still fairly new to Nina, I am a pediatric cardiologist in the, um, uh, in the that lives locally and I provide care to all age kids um, but I'm also exceedingly aware of the high risk nature of the um, not just COVID illness and the long haul symptoms that I'm frequently seeing in um, kids who are previously healthy. I have kids every day coming to see me in clinic um, that have these more long haul symptoms with exercise intolerance and other um, issues, but also have been, see um, been seeing patients that come through with the MISC, which I know is described as being exceedingly rare, but um, uh, seems to have a more detrimental effect and more impact on our um, uh, uh, patients who are in underrepresented minorities, but also is um, really life-changing, sorry, cat, um, for, um, uh, for these families who are um, seeing kids that are critically ill from both a cardiac and non-cardiac standpoint. Um, and so I would, uh, masks are a very simple, inexpensive, and very doable method of supporting the ongoing decrease in the number of cases in our community and will also help our medical uh, staff and uh, facilities to um, continue to provide public health measures. And that's, I think, the key is this, this is a public measure that we can do simple to really engage our entire community. So I want to um, thank you guys for your time. And um, I apologize for my cat. And uh, hope you that, uh, consider this temporary mask mandate, which can really take us over the, the hump of this final push while we get vaccinations out. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. We'll need the name of your cat for the official record, please. Oliver McGillicuddy, in case anybody was wondering. <laughs> All righty, thank you. Um, anyone else like to uh, address the council at this time? Heidi Keating and then Brian Stearns. Heidi, go ahead. Hi, um, thank you. My name is Heidi Keating, 525 Ryford Road. Um, I am a public health professional. I'm working at the Winnebago County Health Department. Um, and so just my starting point, because I spend a lot of time um, reading the evidence, is that masks are effective in preventing the spread of COVID-19. Um, you know, it, it was disappointing to see uh, the Wisconsin Supreme Court decision. Um, so, our next option is is for municipalities to um, have a put in a mask mandate. Um, so our our best option was really through the state, and that you know it requires everyone. Um, our next best option is for municipalities to um, enact a temporary mask mandate. Um, it just it makes things um, safer and prevents the spread of disease in our community. It levels the playing field for businesses, and so the burden of making this decision is not placed on business owners. 
Um, so, you know, the, the main reason is just to, that I support the mask mandate is just simply to pr prevent the spread of disease and promote a safe and healthy um, environment for, for people that live here. And, you know, I would like to just share a personal story. Um, my daughter, who is a college freshman, um, had COVID this fall. And she doesn't, her, her um, smell and taste has not returned. Um, she's healthy. Um, and, and, you know, she had multiple symptoms um, that are typical of COVID. Headache, body ache, sore throat, that kind of thing as well as losing her smell and taste. And, um, but, you know, she's young and healthy and was able to be out of isolation in 10 days and kind of went back uh, to living, you know, her kind of unique college um, experience, her college year, her freshman year. Um, but it's been five months and her um, smell and taste hasn't returned. And, you know, she doesn't have pre-existing conditions. Um, and, you know, it's, it's, she's not alone. Other people have these lingering symptoms. Um, but, you know, it's, it is a big deal to not have your smell and taste. I mean, and it's five months and it, you know, it could be a lot longer. Um, the research I've done is that she will have to, you know, perhaps do um, work on slowly getting her smell back and it may not come back 100%. Um, so, I mean, you know, and in a lot of ways, we just feel very thankful that it wasn't anything worse. Um, so, you know, I, I kind of cringe when I hear people say that it's not a big deal and that people recover and that, you know, young people don't get it that bad. Um, I, I don't wish on anybody that they lose their smell and taste. Um, so, um, like, like Doug mentioned, um, we have 20% of Winnebago County residents that are fully vaccinated. Um, and each day more, people are being vaccinated. There's more and more places, um, you know, the pharmacies are vaccinating and um, spots are filling up so fast. There's waiting lists. People do want to get vaccinated. So we need to hold out a little longer. And, you know, once we get the people that want to be vaccinated, we, and, you know, we'll just be in a safer position. It's a temporary mask order. Um, we can hold out a little bit longer. Um, and, and lastly, I just want to mention, I was just thinking about Nina and, you know, just the times that I talk with the council about various issues and, and the Nina with pride and um, that idea that, that school motto, um, that, you know, really, you know, the idea of doing something that benefits the community and putting community over self that idea of um, social solidarity that we are in this together and we're wearing masks to protect the community. Thank you. Thank you, Heidi. Brian Stearns, go ahead, welcome. Hi there, everyone, thank you. Uh, my name is Brian Stearns, 9597 Camden Road, New London, Wisconsin. I'm Administrative Chief of Staff at Theta Care. Um, I've also been the Incident Commander for our COVID-19 efforts here over the past, well, more than 12 months now. Um, I also have with me on the call, Dr. Jennifer Frank, who is, I would like to say a couple of words too. I just wanted to share some thoughts on masking, how important it is, uh, what a significant contribution it has made uh, to keeping our community safe along with other safeguards. Um, interesting uh, statistic. I'll go off script a little bit here and uh, share with you something not exactly COVID related, it's flu related. And it's related to um, the number of flu cases per the uh, CDC. Uh, at this point last year, last year, 290,000 people tested positive for influenza. Uh, CDC reported about 1,893 Americans tested positive for influenza this year. 
So there's quite a few stories out there. Um, essentially, we canceled flu this past year. And that was a, obviously a nice side effect, so to speak, of all of the other safeguards that, that we've got in place. So yes, is COVID a novel virus? Is it new? Uh, are we contending with it? Yes. Um, I think about how much worse it could have been when I put that 1900 number up against the 290,000 people tested for flu, influenza. And it, it's, it's pretty obvious um, that, that those safeguards that we put in place worked. I appreciated all the comments that were shared previously. Um, you know, Doug mentioned Michigan. Michigan is on the move with the variants. Uh, I believe the CDC just came out indicating that the B117 is the dominant variant now um, throughout the country. Uh, we are on that trajectory. Um, a couple of weeks ago, uh, we track uh, week to week uh, the information coming out of Wisconsin Department of Health Services with respect to variants, uh, total samples, and the uh, percent that come back as a variant. Uh, two weeks ago, that was just over 3%. This past week, it was over 11%. That was more than a three-fold increase in the variance. So not unexpected. Um, we've been, they, we have been hearing for weeks now how that was marching ahead. And we just now have some information um, with respect to the effect that that's having on hospitalizations. Uh, more specifically, throughout the Fox Valley, uh, this was just a couple of days ago um, the, the Wisconsin Hospital Association reported uh, for the Fox Valley, and this is data coming off of Department of Health Services, on April 14th, we had 14 hospitalized patients. This is not just with respect to Theta Care. This is St. Elizabeth, you know, other hospitals in the Fox Valley. Um, that jumped from April 5th to April 6th to 24th. So, now again, I, I truly hope that that number comes back down, but that could be a little bit of an early sign of what's to come. I want to also point out one of the reasons why this is a little concerning. Um, you know, hopefully we never get back to the numbers that we saw last November, uh, but it won't take much in terms of an increase in hospitalized COVID patients to put an immediate strain on the hospital systems. Why? because there were so much deferred care last year. People put off care, put off necessary care. Our hospital volumes dropped significantly. So we had some cushion capacity last year. We do not have that. All of those folks that had those deferred issues are now coming back more critically ill and sick. And now as we add additional COVID hospitalized patients, that strain is gonna show almost immediately. So I appreciate the opportunity to speak. Again, masking along with the other safeguard behaviors truly make a difference and truly help. Thank you. Thank you very much for joining us. Jennifer, would you like to add anything? Dr. Frank? Please, thank you. Um, Jennifer Frank, my address is 3001 Guardian Lane in Nina. And I am also the mother of four children who are all in the Nina School District, as well as the daughter of two elderly parents who also live in Nina. So I speak as both a family physician, part of our healthcare system locally, but also as a mom and daughter, um, concerned for the health and safety of her family as well. Um, to Brian's point, I think one of the things that is essential is that we work together as a community. One of the ways that the community can help us help the community is by making sure that we do not see any extra patients with COVID that we do not need to see. And masks are an essential way that we are going to help keep our, our numbers down. When we are busy taking care of COVID cases, particularly if we start to see some more of the surges that we've seen historically, it really places a tremendous strain on the nurses and physicians who are caring for patients. It also puts a strain on resources. We have limited supplies, et cetera, all of the things that, that we've already experienced in the last year. It also significantly impacts the care of people who do not have COVID because as we are devoting our time, our resources, our spaces, and um, just all of our energy taking care of COVID patients, we have less to distribute to patients who come in with heart attacks, who've had um, strokes, who've had motor vehicle accidents, et cetera. So it really is much broader of a health issue than just related to COVID. 
Masks are effective. They've been demonstrated to be effective in study after study. It is without question. They are completely harmless. Um, they do not cause any problems with breathing. People are able to use them safely, even down to, I think as one of the other speakers said, down to our, our, our youngest um, community members. There are many unknowns about the variants, and unfortunately, some of the earliest signs that have been alluded to indicate that we may have um, some trouble ahead. Um, we do have an opportunity for vaccinations, which is amazing, um, but we are not anywhere close to where we need to be to have reliable herd immunity. The balance of risks and benefits from a medical, um, scientific, as well as just a common sense perspective are unquestionable in favor of the use of masks to prevent further infection and to keep our community safe. Thank you very much for the opportunity to address you. Thank you very much for joining us tonight. Anyone else like to address the council during the public forum section? Anyone else? Uh, Mr. Skirms, go ahead. Alderman-elect. Thank you. Um, since July of last year, uh, city buildings have been under a mask mandate requirement. And at that time, it was noted that protecting employees and the public was vitally important. That remains true today in our city hall, in our city buildings, but it also remains true in our businesses and our gathering places. I don't need to speak about all the reasons why this makes sense. Um, I, think, I believe we need to do all we can. The way this is structured, uh, the ordinance 2021-08 expires in seven weeks, which is a very short time. It can be terminated prior to that if things get way better and we get ahead of this vaccination thing. So I'm in favor of this. If I could vote for it, I would, but I can't yet. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. And Skirms 116 and a half West Wisconsin Avenue. All right. Thank you. Uh, anyone else like to talk to us on the uh, public forum? Anyone else? Sure. Hi, this is Kristen Clark. Can I speak? Sure. Go ahead, Kristen. Give us your name and sure. address. Sure. Kristen Clark. I'm at 549 Ryford Road in Nina. I'm a... Um, also, just like Dr. Frank, a parent of a child in the Nina Public School System, um, a daughter of elderly parents who live in Nina, and also an obstetrician gynecologist at, in the state of care system. Um, and I just, I don't know that I have a, much more to add in addition to what Dr. Frank and some of the, Dr. Creighton, some of the other medical professionals have already spoken to. Uh, but I feel like, you know, it's been a year more than a year, 13 months, we've pulled together as a community to support each other, to support the medical staff. I drive around Nina and see signs in people's yards stronger together. Um, you know, we love our healthcare heroes. And I just feel like a couple more months, if we can continue to protect the, the community and, uh, you know, and as a fallout of that, continue to protect the healthcare system, our providers, our nurses, all of us are exhausted, you know, we're doing our very best, but the more we can do in the community, the better it is for all of us. So I'll end and thank you very much for your time. Thank you for your comments. Anyone else? All right, with that, I will close the public forum. Uh, item number seven is mayor council consideration of any public forum issues. Is there anyone who, from the council who would like to ask a question or make a comment. Alderman Lundrum. Thank you, Mayor. I'd like to probably address um, Doug Guerin, Can, or maybe one of the doctors. I'm not sure who knows the answer to this question. As when we talk about the vaccination rollout, so my question is, does it seem to you, from what you have heard, that it will look like the status quo, that we get what we have been getting, I don't know, it was 150,000 or something this week, or will the rollout be increasing as the days go on? Mr. Guerin? Thank you for that question and the opportunity to respond. Um, so the rest of, for the rest of April, we're likely to see 
a fairly consistent amount of vaccine be available uh, in terms of the vaccine that's flowing to healthcare systems, uh, public health departments. There may be a slight increase for vaccine that is going to pharmacies. Um, having a little bit of a bump in the road with the Janssen or Johnson and Johnson single dose vaccine due to some production issues, um, but we should see. Um, level and perhaps slightly increasing amounts of vaccine um, for the rest of this month uh, with an expected increase of vaccine in, uh, in May. Thank you. Any other questions or comments from the council? Alderman Erickson. Thank you, Mayor. I have a question for Doug as well. Um, has this Use your, your microphone. Use your mic. I'm sorry. I have a question for Doug Guerin as well. Has this issue or this um, mask recommendation been put before the um, Winnebago County Board? And if so, is it up for the Winnebago County Board? Or are you leaving it up to the municipalities? Yes, the, um, the health department issued a mask order. Um, several weeks ago, um, it was tabled by the county board. Um, we've certainly had some discussion about whether we should be reissuing one at this time. We do believe that a mask order is appropriate. However, uh, given the lack of support that we've had um, at the county board level, we're holding temporarily on that. Um, we do know that, of course, Oshkosh um, has a mask order in place. Allegheny County has a mask order in place. Um, this is the very situation that we were trying to avoid um, by asking the county board to support a mask order, which they did not. Um, and um, we will continue to monitor and reaffirm the need for masking um, and, and may get to a point where we feel we have enough support um, to, to pass one at the county board level, unfortunately, it's not. Um, it's not that it's not. A, it's not the same situation or opportunity that you have here tonight. You have the opportunity to, uh, as a municipality, issue a mask mandate and have that go into effect immediately. Um, currently, current uh, county ordinance has been modified such that even if I issue an order, again. It's still only advisory until affirmed by the county board, and that could be up to 14 days later. So um, I, I'm in regular communication with the county board supervisor, county executive, and our corporation council about this situation. We wish we could do more right now, um, um, but certainly the county board has not been supportive to date of um, putting a mask mandate in place uh, for the entire area of the Winnebago County Health Department. Um, so I would certainly urge you um, to move ahead to set an example for others um, to you know, provide that opportunity for you know, businesses to have a little playing field, not have to try to make those decisions individually, to encourage persons that want to um, enter establishments where they know that they're going to be safe to come into Nina to do that. Thank you. Anyone else? <laughs> Alderman Lang. I also have a quick question for Doug Guerin. Um, at one point in the recent past on the county um, update that we receive as an email um, and I follow as an alderman, at one point in the recent past, the county website had reported um, 82% of those 65 and up in Winnebago County had received at least one vaccine. Um, and I'm wondering, what is the target you have in mind for vaccination rate? Um, I'm just curious about that. And actually, that it doesn't report that anymore. I don't see that when I look at that report every day or, you know, not on the weekends, but most days of the week. And I'm wondering... Um, it, it kind of changed. It was kind of fun to watch that number going up and up, and it was exciting, whatever. It's like, wow, 82%. Um, and then that's not on there anymore. But my question to you is, what is the target rate for vaccination for the county? Thank you 
you for that question. Um, ultimately, our target is everyone. I mean, we really certainly need everyone to be vaccinated. We know that that uh, is not going to happen. Um, we know that herd immunity occurs um, at, at a different percentage of the population for different viruses. Um, and, and given what we know right now, um, you know, our target is 80%. Um, we are at uh, over 83% for those age 65 and up. It's unlikely we'll reach 80% for populations that are under that, under that age. Um, time is of the essence. We are racing against the variants right now. And we certainly want to um, get as much vaccine as, as we can out as possible. We certainly want to help those that you know, maybe have some questions or some doubt or hesit hesitance in some ways about receiving vaccine, um, have the information they need to make an informed decision. This is a safe vaccine. Um, and we will continue to vaccinate um, you know, throughout uh, the months to come. We know that um, we probably will reach a point um, by the, at least by the end of next month where uh, we have more vaccine available than, than people that are ready to accept it. Um, but certainly, um, as more information comes out about that, we certainly hope that more people are interested in, in receiving that vaccine that will be protective for all of us. All right. <clears throat> Thank you, Jane. Uh, well, go ahead. Did you want us at this point to be just asking all of our questions and having this full discussion uh, now, I think, or I think uh, it's already not a full discussion. If you have questions of you know the presenters and that, I think now okay. is the time versus later. We can have the discussion amongst the council later. <clears throat> so if you have other questions of any of the presenters, probably now is the time. We try to limit as much as possible, but at times we allow that during the discussion of the issue. Alderman Boyette. Thank you. So I just have a question, and I, I think perhaps maybe Doug would be the one to answer it. But in this mask mandate, how do you enforce it? Like, who polices it? Who, who's in charge of, I mean, I know small businesses and and the city buildings, you know, the people there can do that. But out in the community, who, who enforces that? And, and how is it I, enforced? We're going to ask uh, attorney, uh, our city attorney to address that uh, question. City Attorney Westbrook. Um, so I think that would probably be better addressed during the discussion on the agenda rather than in the public forum. Um, I don't know that Doug Guerin, he was not a part of drafting this ordinance. Um, so he has read it just as much as any of you have. So I think it would be more appropriate to have that. That's fine. I was just looking yep. for, you know, if he's got experience in this whole thing with, with what he dealt with on the county level. Because I, I, I just don't have that. That's way out of my realm. I don't know how we would do that or how it would be done. Oh, that's fine. Is that okay? Yeah. Okay. Anyone else? Alderman Stevenson. Thank you, Mayor. Um, given the um, the email that we received, the council received from our city attorney uh, regarding the details and procedure involved in with a motion to suspend our rules, um, this, the, the motion to suspend our rules is a non-debatable motion. So the council has concerns about the process of violating our rules to take an action immediately. Now is the only time we had to talk about it. Is that not true? Discussion can happen whether or not you, you vote to um, suspend the rules. Suspending the rules only allows for the vote. I understand that. Discussion but, but, can happen. But once the motion is made and seconded to oh. suspend the rules, we cannot discuss or debate the functional result of suspending our rules. Correct. So I wish to speak to that now because I have no other opportunity to do that. Is that correct? Yes, and the mayor, as the parliamentarian, would 
decide whether that's in order or not. It's, it's, in the, it's a, we're under all the open forum, so there is no restriction as to content by which I respond to the audience. Is that correct? Any, any council member can ask unanimous consent to make a statement. Well, this, I, I'm responding to the many of the nine members who spoke in support of the ordinance to acknowledge that they are going to be asking for a suspension of rules. Okay, so I want to speak to that. Um, I've been a member of this board for over 31 years. Uh, and, and on a rare occasion, have we been asked to suspend our rules. Uh, rule 9J, which can be found on your, in your book of rules that every council member gets, states that ordinances and resolutions can be introduced by any member of the council and before being voted upon, shall be referred to the city attorney for approval as to form and validity. My understanding is that the city attorney has reviewed the ordinance and has in fact already drafted it. And that's what we received based on Alder Person Steele's request, which is very appropriate. The city attorney shall give an option on that same action. No ordinance shall be passed or adopted at the same meeting at which it is offered in the event any member of the council requests seem to be laid over until the next meeting. So in essence, if it's brought up, we, have to, we, we cannot take action on that, that ordinance. And, and that interpretation of the rule, has, as I said, in the, has existed for over 31 years and it was in place when I was seated as a council member. Um, uh, Ms. Marecki, I believe, uh, from 9th Street used the term wise leadership. Well, with wise leadership comes good government. Um, so this, this rule is in place to make sure that the council provides fair and equitable data to be presented to the council on any and all ordinances that comes before it. It's to protect that good government. It's to make sure that the council understands completely what the legislative purpose of the ordinance is, how it will function, and what the functional, and that it functions in a purposeful way that is enforceable and that it does not cause undue hardship on unintended constituents, which I, I don't know that this ordinance may not do, but certainly would be discussed in at length during a, a traditional proceeding, which would be deferred to committee. The committee, committee takes up the ordinance, discusses the ordinance, asks the, some of the very questions that have been asked already, and which I have multiple of. Um, so. I am a survivor of COVID-19. I had COVID-19 in September. My wife had it and was diagnosed the same day. Our, our mentally handicapped daughter also was diagnosed with COVID that same week. Thank God that we got through the, the experience with minimal symptoms and the good Lord looked down on us and, and we are here to continue to live this great life. I wear a mask every time. I enter a building. Every time I go to church, which we, I, I sit on the Rise Again Committee at our church um, because I have a passion to keeping people safe. Um, so I care about the safety of our kids. This ordinance doesn't require Nia Joint School Districts to live by the rules by which the ordinance is written. I care about the kids, so I want to make sure I understand how that happens. I don't have any representatives short of Alder Person Borchard here, who I dealt with want to represent the school district in this kind of discussion. I can't answer that question. How is that going to affect the Nina Joint School District? What are they going to do? How are they going to force it? Um, any of the government buildings, any building that may be under the auspices of rent or ownership of the University of Wisconsin is not subject to this ordinance? There are a number of questions. Why, why aren't those included? Is safety not important in those, in those places? But we're not going to get a chance to answer ask those questions if we suspend our rules 
and take action on it tonight when a number of people, and, and I understand completely why they're here to lobby us, but not all constituents have been made aware of the fact that this ordinance is on the table tonight. And I would guess that we would have a much larger crowd, which is what good government is. We would have a much larger crowd if this was known to all the people and not just the supporters of the mass ordinance, which I am one of, by the way. In good government, in two weeks, I would vote for this ordinance in a heartbeat. But I have a fiduciary responsibility to the city of Nina and its residents to make sure that not just those that are for an, a, an ordinance get heard, but so that everyone who has an interest in the issue gets heard. And to, and to pass this ordinance tonight on a, uh, by, by breaking our rules, to do that is in good government. That's all I got now. Any other comments or questions in the mayor council consideration? Alderman Bates. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, my concern is, uh, I believe, from what I understand from the city attorney, that the uh, vote to suspend rules would be only made if we plan on passing this. I would hope that when we get into this discussion, we do all our discussing at the beginning, the way we enforce it, things like that. Uh, my second comment, and I will uh, stop after this. I, I understand uh, Alderman Stevenson's point exactly. That's what we're always here to do, is to hear all the sides. I am just concerned that a two-week delay could cause uh, irreparable spread. Thank you. Alderman Boyette and then Alderman Steele. So can I go back to my question then, if I'm not going to be able to ask it later? Can I get it answered here? <laughs> so just to clarify, discussion can happen at the time that it's listed on here. If the motion gets made and doesn't pass to suspend the rules, discussion can still happen here if that's what you choose, or you can choose to follow the rules and send it to committee without discussion here. Um, the motion does not limit discussion. It just says whether or not you can vote on the item today. So discussion can happen whether the motion is approved, not approved, not voted on. Just to be clear. Okay, so. Uh, I just want my Alderman question Boyette. answered before the end of the night. Well, you, you, received, you received a letter from our police chief, did you not? Did you get that email? Uh, yes. Uh, yeah. I okay. didn't get a copy of the ordinance. I can't get it off my phone. I got a copy of the actual ordinance. That would be in the All right, we did get a copy uh, information from our police chief uh, on his uh, enforcement of this, if it would so happen. Um, I have uh, been in touch with Chief uh, Winnebago County Sheriff um, has elected not to enforce it. Winnebago County Health Department, uh, if Mr. Guerin's on, Doug, uh, once in a while I get uh, comments or I get calls that someone's not, uh, some business is not wearing their mask and they call the health department in Winnebago County when there was a mask ordinance. Did, did the health department, were they in charge of enforcing this and were any tickets or citations given or anything like that by the health department? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, we are the recipients of all complaints, or we certainly try to be the recipients of all complaints that come in related to any mask-related uh, issues. Um, we respond uh, to all of those complaints. Uh, we contact businesses. Um, we try to provide information, educate, provide resources, uh, try to assist them in uh, being as safe as they can. Um, and we have never issued a citation yet. Um, we have provided, we have, and, and, and under, the, under the state mask mandate, you know, our, our step there would really be to make a referral to the district attorney first, but we've never done that once. Um, we have been able to, you know, contact, inform, assist, 
um, educate um, all of those that have had complaints against them. Um, I think many are just happy to know that someone did complain um, and that gives them an opportunity to respond. And, and we were, we were certainly there to help walk them through that process, to help them um, identify resources, uh, you know, refer them to weed guidance or any other uh, information that we have available that can help them. You know, our, our goal isn't to, so to penalize, it's, it's really to help them understand the, the benefits of, of masking and, you know, give them some tools to, to help them work through that process. And so we've never found it necessary to, to refer for enforcement or issue a citation or to the district attorney um, since the beginning of the outbreak. Hey, right, thank you. And, and then as long as I have you, Doug, so early in your presentation, you, you gave a percent of elderly or over 62 or something that have been vaccinated. What was that percent again in Winnebago County? In Winnebago County, for residents aged 65 and older, um, we have a greater than 83% of those persons that have received at least one dose of vaccine. Okay, thank you. And then, as long as I have you, and I guess I'm going to ask this question because I, I, I don't think I've... Well, tomorrow it'll come out, but in Winnebago County for the last uh, two weeks, how many deaths have there been and how has hospitalization increased, those two statistics? Um, in the past two weeks, I believe we're only reporting one death. One? Um, typically, deaths are, um, the death reporting is typically significantly delayed. Um, it takes a period of time from a death um, to be uh, really processed in such a way and, and identified such that we get notification, you know, at the health department. So, you know, you usually, there are usually weeks of delay. And, but certainly deaths have gone down tremendously um, as we've been able to protect um, our most vulnerable and, and really... I mean, if you were to choose one criteria that is a, a primary determinant of the likelihood of hospitalization or death, it would be age. And um, our, our average age of hospitalizations, which, you know, prior to vaccine, we were seeing an average age of hospitalization in the high 70s. Today, with vaccine, our average age of hospitalization is in, is in the upper 50s. Um, so that age has really come down um, um, and, and as was highlighted earlier, hospitalizations um, have increased quite a bit just uh, in the last few days. Uh, we don't know if that's just a, a, a small spike or if that will continue, um, but we are definitely seeing case rates uh, increase. And so that, that may be a sign of things to come. Hospitalization and deaths are lagging indicators of, of, our, of the number of cases that we have. Thank you very much for answering that. Uh, uh, Alderman Steele. Um, yeah, I, I guess I'd like to add, if, in case it wasn't clear from what um, Mr. Guerin was saying, is that deaths are also a lagging indicator because COVID doesn't necessarily kill people immediately. Um, generally, people get sick and they get sicker and they get sicker and they're hospitalized and then they're in the ICU and then they're on a ventilator and then they die, sometimes weeks later. So. Unfortunately, deaths are not a great indicator of how well we were, are doing against this disease. Um, I am going to ask for a suspension of the rules to allow an, a vote. I feel this is an urgent matter that requires urgent action on our part. Um, the agenda is publicized on the city website. It's not a secret what is going to be on this agenda. And anybody on this council, in fact, but we, we probably are more aware of this than the general public, but anybody on the council can obviously, you know, call up their friends one way or the other and say, you know, we need you to come out or we need you and all your buddies to come out and speak to this. So it's not, I, I, I guess, no, probably the majority of people who feel one way or the other are not paying attention to what's on the city council. But it is a p on public record, and so I don't feel that that is necessarily a, a good reason for delaying. I am concerned about the delay of weeks that it may take to get this to another committee 
and then back to the council for a vote. I am very concerned about that lag. That lag can make a significant difference in how the virus spreads. Um, I'd also like to speak for a moment to the, to the, um, to the issue of enforcement. I, I mean, we, we kind of got this sense from what Mr. Guerin said, but the basic, but my basic observation was that enforcement was probably not particularly necessary. I think we live in a community of people who mostly abide by our rules once they know what they are. I, for one, just, I mean, this is slightly anecdotal, but just this weekend, I was in two Nina grocery stores, and in both of them, for the first time in months, I saw unmasked people, and unmasked people kind of looking kind of smug about it. And that has just not happened for months. And in both cases, I talked to the managers of the stores, and they said, no, we're offering masks, but we're no longer telling people they have to leave if they aren't going to wear one. Well, there is a grocery store in Appleton that is doing that. And so, frankly, I, and I'm not alone, I'm going to be shopping there until I feel like I can safely go into our local community businesses. This is not going to be a good thing for business if this is allowed to go on. And I think what we do as a city speaks to what we what we expect of our citizens and also expresses that this is it sends a message to our residents that this is important. And I think the majority of people are willing to abide by those. And I think without that, there is a certain segment of the population that is going to use the vernacular, say, screw you. I'm not do it. I don't care. And I'm not going to wear a mask. So um, unfortunately, I think, I think what we do here, fortunately or unfortunately, I think what we do here matters, what I'm trying to Right. Uh, Alderman Erickson. Thank you, Mayor. I do have a question. Alderman Boyette brought this up previously. Um, she said that she'd like to see a copy of the ordinance, and then there was a comment made that it's on the, um, in the new business. But somebody had mentioned that there is, this is a seven-week temporary ordinance, but I don't see that written anywhere. Is, where is the ordinance? I that think we it's at the very back. It says it expires on May 31st. On your pack, it's in the packet. Oh, okay. It's not on the agenda. Yeah, this is under fourteen or. Okay, so then I have to dig into the packet. Okay. It's under Roman numeral fourteen B. Roman numeral fourteen B is the. Okay, I just want to make sure. All right. Thank you, Alderman Steele, Alderman Erickson. You want to That's it. Follow up. Okay. Good. Uh, anyone else? We are in the uh, mayor council consideration. I have had one request from someone to speak uh, online. Uh, the public forum has been closed. Um, we've been asking questions of folks. So I'll tell you what, I'll be creative here. And uh, I will ask Mr. Wilkinson a question since he has asked to speak. How's that for creativity? Yeah, you can ask your question. Mr. Wilkinson, uh, what would you like to uh, address the council on? Well, it seems to me that the discussion that's been going on is, is based on a lot of assumption. Um, so I guess I would like to know what, uh, what scientific evidence or study is there that's available that the council is using to substantiate a mask mandate? to show that a mask, uh, the use of masks actually work. There's a lot of guidelines that are out by the CDC or the World Health Organization, but I'm unaware of any scientific study that proves the effectiveness of mask wearing. In fact, there's actually evidence that mask wearing does not do anything and it makes it worse. Uh, if anybody wants to check out Dr. Lee Merritt's uh, study on that or information on that, I would encourage you to do that. Um, all we have to do is look at some evidence, some, impure, uh, some, some evidence that is from our own state. Things were not that bad in this state until the mask mandate, the state mask mandate, actually went into play. You just need to look at what happened at Oshkosh Prison 
to know what happened when a mask mandate went into play. Things were not bad down there until a mask mandate went into place. And then, all heck broke loose down there. But the, the evidence seems to indicate that a mask mandate does not work. And so I, I would ask if, if a decision is going to be made or the conversation is going to move forward with the assumption that a mask mandate is in, uh, effective, what scientific data do you have to prove that? Right. The other thing I would want to know is with regard to the discussion on the quote unquote vaccine, it's not a vaccine. It's an experimental drug. All three of them are experimental drugs. They have not gone through FDA approval. At this point, they cannot be considered a vaccine. They call it that. But a vaccine is something that actually stops something, like the smallpox vaccine. The smallpox vaccine will stop any variant of smallpox. The current COVID quote-unquote vaccine, there is, to, to the best of my knowledge, there is no scientific study or data to show that that will 100% positively stop any variants. So if that's the case, then it would seem that the, the vaccine or the, the suggestion that people should get the vaccine um, is really based on a false premise. All right, thank you. I guess the last question I would have would be the assumption that it is up to the council to determine my rights as a citizen. We already had uh, one of the persons here, I think it was Doug, testify to the dropping rate, the death rate. There's been no discussion as to the number of deaths in Winnebago County that are solely from COVID. And we know that those are drastically uh, overplayed. So there's a lot of other underlying factors that coupled with COVID have resulted in deaths, but not solely from COVID. And, and again, you look, I think one of the things he touched on was the, uh, the age. But there's no doubt that is impacting people in the 60, 65 and up category. But that does not address or give people the right to mandate to people that are under that age restrictions on their freedom because somehow it makes somebody feel better. And that's really what it seems to come down to. This is something that makes people feel better, but there's no basis or scientific evidence uh, that, that substantiates that. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Wilkinson, can we just have your address, please, just for the record? Yeah, my address is 714 Cedar Street. All right, thank you very much. Um, anyone like to reply? Or You're welcome to, but... Uh, I'm speechless. Alderman I'm sorry. Steele, go ahead. I, 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 uh, we don't have enough time to go through all of the misinformation that was just given. I, I'm sorry. If okay. anyone is interested in a later time, I'd be happy to direct you to how you can locate that, how you can do the research to find all of the evidence to support masking and vaccines. Thank all you. right. Anyone else uh, have any comments or questions of any other <laughs> any folks? Comments? This is a mayor council consideration of the issue, so it's appropriate. All the men. I have another question going back to the enforcement issue. Um, Alderman Steele mentioned um, seeing people within a store not wearing masks. And I guess my concern is um, how do we enforce that with privacy rights? And, you know, how do you, how do you go up to someone who's not wearing a mask and ask them why they're not wearing them. I mean, you know, for some conditions, you, you're allowed to not wear a mask, but are you allowed to ask a person? 
if they have a condition that allows them to not wear a mask. I get, I'm concerned about privacy issues with enforcement, I guess, is my question. It, it's my understanding, can I answer that? Go ahead, uh, Alderman Steele. It's my understanding that we're not allowed, you're not allowed to ask about conditions, but I will also tell you that there are virtually no medical conditions that preclude the use of a mask. In fact, if someone is so ill with an acute asthma exacerbation that they cannot or feel that they cannot wear a mask, they should absolutely not be, not be out in public because that would put them at very high risk of dying, basically, if they get this disease. So, so, the, so that, that, that's been debunked in so many ways, I can't, I, can't, I, I don't know where to start. Well, I um, think when we get to the discussion, if, if there's a discussion, uh, we will ask Chief Olson how we plan to enforce this. Anyone else? Uh, Alderman Bates, go ahead. Alderman Bates. Thank you, Mayor. Um, just to answer Mr. Wilkinson's uh, uh, query, uh, if you look in the JAMA Network Journal of American Medicine Association, uh, uh, February 10th, 2021, they list 11 different studies, if, even in that one article, about the effectiveness of uh, wearing masks. Thank you. All right. Anyone else? I know we've uh, traveled all over here, and, and I'm going to take some liberty here. I, I do have one question that's pressing, and since I have uh, Dr. Frank, is Dr. Frank, yeah, Dr. Frank still on the line? Uh, Dr. Frank, if I could just ask you a question. No, it's here. She's there. Yeah, she's there, but she... Okay, well... Dr. Frank, are you available for a question? I don't see Brian Sturms or Dr. Sturms uh, uh, here anymore. Uh, okay, well then I'll, I'll wait. So uh, maybe she'll come back or something. Uh, that with that, I am going to uh, close the mayor council consideration and uh, we will move on to the consent agenda. Uh, Alderman Bates, you have a motion? Yes, I would like to remove item, the only item on the consent agenda and report on it from the Public Service and Safety Committee, please. Uh, you, uh, Alderman Bates uh, has asked, we don't need a motion, or we don't need a second, I don't believe, to remove anything from the consent agenda. An alderman can just do that, is that correct? Nope. I'll go to that 30, 31 years of experience. Well, she's, I think she's reported out there in committee and have it sent. She's going to report it out. In the, in the pre, since I've been here, anyone can ask that it be removed from, an item be removed from the consent agenda and yeah. report it out during the thing. Is that okay? Is that okay? Okay, so that's uh, been requested and that will be ordered. Uh, with that, Alderman Stevenson. Uh, yeah, uh, uh, out of consideration for a couple of people here that are interested only in the um, resolution, uh, the proclamator's proclamation under 14, Roman numeral 14A, I'm going to make a motion to move up uh, item agenda item 14A from uh, its current location on the agenda to right now. Second. All right, thank you very much. Uh, there's a motion and a second to adjust the agenda and move that item and take it up now. Uh, is there any objection to that request? Seeing none, that's ordered. So we are on item number, let me get my bearings here now. We are on item uh, under new business. We are on item number 14A, council ratification of mayoral proclamation renaming the Nina Slough within the city of Nina. Um, Mayor. We are, that's uh, taking that up at this time. Alderman Stevenson. I'll make a motion to approve the mayoral proclamation uh, identified as City of Nina, Nina Creek proclamation at, uh, to the Common Council. Second. There's a motion and a second mm -hmm. to ratify the mayor proclamation, which renames the Nina Slough within the City of Nina. Discussion or comments? I am. Uh, I would just like to, a couple things. Uh, 
I guess you can all read the proclamation. I did my best to try and take in what I thought the council in the discussions that we had um, and come up with something that uh, hopefully fit everyone's uh, okay. I'd like to personally thank uh, Mr. Ron Klatt, who's in the audience, who has kind of uh, pushed us on this issue and championed this issue. And uh, this has been around a long time and there's no agreement uh, to much of anything in, in the past years. We have found a solution that I think is, you know, a reasonable solution to most people and we're gonna give it uh, an effort and we're going to, uh, I'm gonna direct and ask the Public Works to properly sign the areas within the city limits, this, and uh, with regards to official documents and that, uh, it's still probably going to not be on those official documents, but I think for a lot of the reasons that are mentioned in the proclamation, um, we have done one heck of a good job. The state of Wisconsin, the city, the paper mills, the DNR have cleaning up that slough, the park and rec department, and all the efforts that have went in to made that uh, waterway uh, a, a lot better than it was when I was a kid. And so I think this is a, a, one of those things that will have some positive impact, hopefully, on the community. So um, with that, I would, uh, I'll skip the whereas's, but I'll say, now therefore, I, Dean Crawford, Mayor of the City of Nina, do hereby proclaim the renaming of the slough to Nina Creek and direct staff to properly place signs at the locations within city boundaries. And I will call this proclamation to the attention of all of our citizens. Signed and sealed the 7th day of April, 2021, Dean Crawford, Mayor. So all in favor of the proclamation, signify by saying aye. 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 It says a roll call. Do we need a roll call, Adam, or not? No. We don't need a roll call. <laughs> uh, is there any object? Is there any no's to the proclamation? No. One no by Alderman Bates. Any other no's? Okay. Uh, Alderman Bates will be uh, uh, put in as a, a no. That so pa that passes. Thank you all very much for uh, that. Alderman Stevenson. Yeah, and, and I think the, you know all the reasons that we pass this uh, to a direct public works to put up signs it, it are all good things. But we also have a fair a number of interactive maps on our own website that reference the Nina Slough. And I would hope that, that would, we would also take aggressive action on our, our own website to acknowledge the action the council just took. Okay, thank you. I think that's easy enough. Okay, thanks. Um, Mr. Klatt, thank you for your efforts and appreciate you sticking around tonight. <laughs> uh, then Mar we will move Marge on to... Marge has a question, Mayor. Marge. Good. Marge. Uh, Alderman Bates. Thank you, Mayor. In reference to Alderman Stevenson's suggestion, will it also be listed as Na Nina Slough in addition to the creek? Because if you look on anything with uh, GPS maps or things like that, it's still going to say slough. So if you don't know the difference, you're going to think there's two different things going on. Thank you. All right. Uh, item number nine, report of standing committees, regular public services and safety committee meeting of March 30th, 2021. Chairman Bates, go ahead. Thank you, Mayor. I will start off with the uh, street use permit for bike to boogie concert. In a previous uh, uh, public service and safety committee meeting, we motioned to, uh, uh, recommended to council to approve it based on a uh, venue change uh, and it was postponed from the March 17th, 2021 Common Council. I would like to refer it back to the Public Services and Safety Committee because the venue change changed it from a park to a public street. And I think it'd be important for uh, businesses and other people that are traversing that street to have the opportunity to come and uh, give us their opinions. So my, I make a motion to refer it back to Public Services and Safety. Alderman, Alderman and I have contacted Future Nina and they were okay with that. Alderman Bates moves to refer this back to the public, the next Public Services and Safety Committee meeting. Is there a second? Second. There's a second by Alderman Stevenson it, uh, on the motion to refer. Any discussion? All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Are there aye. any opposed? 
Hearing no oppose, that's so ordered. Alderman Bates. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, reporting out from the March 30th, 2021 meeting, minutes can be found on the city website. Committee recommends council approve resolution number 2021-07, amending the fence restriction on the nature trail subdivision plats for lots 2, 3, 20, 21, 22, 39, 40, 41, 51, 52, 53, and 54, and I would so move. Second. There's a motion by Alderman Bates, seconded by Alderman Stevenson. <clears throat> approve resolution number 2021-07. Any further discussion? We have uh, spent a lot of time and effort on this, so uh, I think most of the questions have been answered. There's a motion and a second. All in favor will vote aye. All opposed, any opposed will vote no. As the clerk calls the roll, please. Other person Lang? Aye. Lundrum? Aye. Orchard? Aye. Hillstrom? Aye. Steele? Aye. Erickson? Aye. Stevenson? Aye. Boyette? Aye. And Bates? Aye. Motion carries. That motion passes. Um, I'd just like to uh, thank uh, uh, one of our constituents, uh, Ms. Gleesner, for uh, your work on this. I, I, I just, usually I don't do this, but I just want to, it's a perfect example um, how people can make a difference in this community and, and one person can, you know, can, can get something done and, and the council uh, listen. So many times I hear from folks that say, Oh, you know, I, I won't come to the meeting because it ain't going to make a difference or, you know, I'm not going to fight City Hall. And here's a perfect opportunity how um, you made a difference So for your neighborhood. So thank you. I'm sorry, Alderman Bates, go ahead. Item two, committee recommends council approve the City of Nina Police Department participation in the Winnebago County Speed Task Force 2021 Speed Summer Enforcement Grant from June 1st, 2021 to August 31st, 2021. And I would so move. Second. There's a motion and a second by Alderman Hillstrom. Discussion. Seeing no discussion, all in favor will vote aye. All opposed will vote no as the clerk calls the roll. Alderperson person Lendrum? Aye. Borchert? Aye. Hillstrom? Aye. Steele? Aye. Erickson? Aye. Stevenson? Aye. Boyette? Aye. Bates? Aye. And Lang. Aye. Motion carries. That motion passes. Committee recommends council approve ordinance 2021-06, allowing for temporary outside seating due to COVID-19. And I would so move. Second. There's a motion by Alderman Bates. Is there a second? Second. Borchard. Seconded by Alderman Borchardt. Any further discussion or questions? All in favor will vote aye. All opposed will vote no as the clerk calls the roll. Alderperson Borchert? Aye. Hillstrom? Aye. Steele? Aye. Erickson? Aye. Stevenson? Aye. Boyette? Aye. Bates? Aye. Lang? Aye. And Landrum? Aye. Motion carries. That motion passes. I would. The committee I, recommends council approve ordinance 2021 07, allowing for temporary mm. sales of merchandise on public sidewalks due to COVID-19, and I would so move. Second. Okay. There's a motion by Alderman Bates, seconded by Alderman Hillstrom. Any discussion on this item? Uh, all, seeing none, all in favor will signify by saying aye. All opposed signify by saying no. As the clerk calls the roll. Alderperson Hillstrom? Aye. Steele? Aye. Erickson? Aye. Stevenson? Aye. Boyette? Aye. Bates? Aye. Lang? Aye. Lendrum? Aye. And Borchert. Aye. Motion carries. Thank you. That motion passes. Lastly, I have committee recommends council approve the purchase of a progressive 800214 remote controlled lawnmower from Rinders Incorporated in Appleton in the amount of $48,952. And I would so move. Second. There's a motion by Alderman Bates, seconded by Alderman Lane. Any discussion on this item? Alderman Stevenson gets week one of doing the lawn on Winnick County Avenue, and there's a sign-up sheet, I think. As long as I don't hurt my thumbs. <laughs> it's a remote control lawnmower. You'll get carpal tunnel and you'll have workman's comp, so I don't know. Jerry. And I'll have my mask on. <laughs> there's a motion and a second. All in favor will vote aye. All opposed will vote no as the clerk calls the roll. 
Alderperson Steele? Aye. Erickson? Aye. Stevenson? Aye. Boyette? Aye. Bates? Aye. Lang? Aye. Landrum? Aye. Borchert? Aye. And Hillstrom? Aye. Motion carries. That motion passes. Thank you. Thank you for your report, Alderman Bates. Uh, I just take a, one comment, and that's I've talked to many uh, people in the uh, hospitality industry and also uh, some of our small businesses the past two weeks and told them that we were reaffirming this for this summer, too, because COVID and that. Mm -hmm. And uh, they're very appreciative. They are, it, it is a gesture that I think uh, other communities are going to follow. And we were one of the leaders in doing this. And uh, Chris and them have done a good job in coming up with one of those other solutions, once again, that helps the small businesses in our community. So um, that's great. So thank you. Uh, item number B is the regular finance and personnel committee meeting of March 29, 2021. Chairman Erickson. Thank you, Mayor. Reporting out from the regular finance and personnel committee meeting of March 29, 2021. Item number one, the committee recommends council approve resolution number 2021-06 for the 2021 community development block grant and authorize entering into agreements for the activities subject to approval by the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development. And I so move. There's a motion by Alderman Erickson. Is there a second? Second. There's a second by Alderman Borchert. Discussion. First of all, uh, Mr. Tisdale, and I apologize, but I didn't catch your name, ma'am. Carla Morfin. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you both for coming tonight. I apologize for the delay. Uh, you kind of got on a, a night where we had an issue that took a while, so I appreciate your indulgence and in, in waiting for your item to come up. I have asked uh, a representative from the uh, Fair Housing Council, which is one of the recipients of this money, to come and just give us a short presentation on the use of their funds. Uh, I had some questions uh, with regards to this um, organization. Uh, one of them I'm sure they'll address is that uh, they have no local office right now in this area of uh, Nina, Appleton, anywhere they operate out of Milwaukee. Uh, that concerned me, and so I just wanted to hear from them themselves on some of the um, the statistics that they have that show how many NINA residents they're uh, helping, and, and not 54956 zip code, uh, because that takes in town of NINA, Clayton, and things like that, and they don't pay for that. Right. We do. So I want to know how many city, I'd like to know how many city of NINA residents, um, when they're going to have a presence back in the community, and how they help the community spend in these dollars, and maybe another question or two. So uh, with that, I'm going to give you a, up to five minutes to kind of give us a, a, a little bit about your organization. And I talked to Carol about this, and I appreciate you coming. So welcome. Thank you, Mr. Christopher. We appreciate the opportunity uh, from the main investment. Thank you for the opportunity to speak with you. My name is Larry Tisdale. I'm the president of the CEO of the Metropolitan Milwaukee Fair Housing Council. I've been with the organization for 33 years, uh, as has Carla. Uh, we have a lot of Milwaukee. Uh, we have uh, a program that was based in Milwaukee, or based in Milwaukee since 1977. Uh, we also have two satellite offices, which cover service areas in the Fox Valley, which cover Brown County, North Carolina, and the city of Fargo. I mentioned to my satellite office in Madison, which covers Madison and Dane County. Um, well, the Fair Housing Council is a private nonprofit organization. Uh, we basically enforce federal, state, and local fair housing laws. The city of New York does not have a local fair housing ordinance. Uh, we uh, have protected classes that are covered under each of those categories for our city and local. If the city has a local ordinance or the county has a local ordinance or county has a local ordinance. Uh, Mr. Tizio, Mr. Tizio, Mr. Tizio, could could you just try and get a little closer to the microphone, maybe? Uh, we're, we're having a little difficulty here in you, so let's try just get a little bit closer. How's that? How's that? Better? That's better. That is better. Thank you. Okay. So um, our enforcement program um, is direct assistance. 
components uh, are from individuals or complaints are from individuals who believe they've been encountered, uh, encountered a situation that's prohibited under fair housing laws. And under the protected classes, there are a number of protected classes, I'm going to all of them here. Uh, also, um, in the college and education component, uh, that is a proactive way to achieve enforcement through education. You have other organizations uh, throughout the service area, the Northeast service area, and um, those organizations work with us not only to refer complaints to us, but when we receive a complaint that is a non fair housing related complaint, we can refer them to uh, those organizations that are other organizations in this community. Um, Given the shortness of time, Carla is going to introduce herself and talk a little bit about those uh, statistics and information on the profit that you are asking about, and then we'll come back with the additional information. I can tell you initially that we will uh, talk to you about the, um, the location of the office after Carla finishes her presentation. I'll make sure she gets that information in. Okay. 